Hello dear ones, it's Alice. I'm of the stars and I have an unusual topic for you today to do with the, the lower intestine, the bowel as they say. So, <laughs> this, is, this is so out there. I, I logged on to it, oh, maybe a year ago and, and I just couldn't, you know, I couldn't put it out there on the internet because it was just too much for me but but now I have a better like um, framework to hold it in that makes more sense I think to everybody including healers I have some trouble figuring out how to approach this topic because uh, while it's a naturopathic topic and it was well known in uh, in the days of my grandparents it's gone by the wayside because of the advent of traditional medicine. These days, I believe there's are the times when uh, some of the old remedies are coming back. For instance, you can see them in the drugstores now. Um, the old time remedies that that worked really well and weren't very expensive and and had simple ingredients in them. So I. I've been rereading a book that, uh, that's a favorite of mine called Become Younger by a, a gentleman named Norman Walker. And uh, in it, it talks about the very important steps we can take to become younger by eating foods that ha are raw and vital, uh, as raw as possible, like raw fruit juices or raw um, vegetable juices or raw vegetables, that kind of thing, raw nuts. And um, the importance of using um, uh, some method to clear out the bowels, um, like, for instance, a water and vinegar enema, like that. And, the, and he waits until the very end of the book to talk about that because it's not a topic that most people, you know, that most people enjoy. But in years past, I tried this method and I found that it really does immediately make the lymph system and the clear up and the, 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 the taste that comes from the salivary glands, the, 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 the taste in, you, in your mouth even, it, everything becomes very light and clear. So, so there's something to this. This theory. This gentleman lived a long time, and he lived a very, a very um, energetic life, and he was in tip-top health all that time, as far as I know. So, so anyway, that's the beginning. That that it's very important what we what we take into our bodies as food, and and it's very important to clear out the bowels once in a while. I suggest once a week for perfect health and for longevity. It it allows the body to to regenerate tissue much more quickly and to heal tissue that's not completely healthy. So, so I would suggest that the minute that we, that we feel um, the onset of any kind of um, cold or flu or any kind of physical pain, anything like that, especially as we get older. When younger, it's not that important because our thymus is working really well and all the tissues regenerate really fast. The metabolism is, is moving faster and so forth. It's much easier to heal when young. So, uh, so that's the beginning of the talk that I'm about to give, is that it's been known in many ages past uh, that, the, that especially what we eat, if we eat stuff that's raw and vital, full of vital energy, then that brings energy into the system, and that if we use um, uh, a water enema, or in some cases colonics, if that's available and trustworthy, um, colonics being administered by a professional, right, and more thorough than the water enema, then uh, then what happens is that the that foods clear through the body very fast, and that very great load of energy that we spend on getting alimentation into the body and, and getting it out again is minimized and optimized. So that's the first thing. It's my plug for, for vital foods and, and water enemas. 
<laughs> so now the second thing has to do with various theories that I have because uh, recently I took up specifically um, water enemas again with a little bit of vinegar uh, added, a t tablespoon or so, two tablespoons. And, and I used them in hopes that it would help to deal with the unconscious thought cloud of the world, which becomes very unruly um, on Friday and Saturday nights in a large city. Now, if you've read Arthur Powell's books, which are classics of occult literature and explanations of the theosophical point of view, then you'll get the notion, the understanding of what's really happening in the large cities on the weekends. Um, Arthur Powell describes, for instance, how when a man walks down, they, they used to say man in those days, they never said woman. <laughs> It was just, uh, I talked to my mother about it. I said, Mom, why do they always say man? Why don't they say woman half the time? And she said, oh, oh my goodness, they mean nothing by it. She said, mm, this is merely a literary convention. <laughs> and my mother was very in favor of empowering women, so I guess she knew what she was talking about. I took it, I took it that it doesn't mean much, and I hope you will too. So... Anyway, to get back to the theosophical literature, Arthur Powell, in a classic uh, passage, described how when a man walks down a city street, he's followed by a, a, like a, a, a train or entourage of thought forms, thought forms that were in his own mind. It's like a, the tail of a comet walking along with him. And people who get too close as they say in martial arts, within the ma of another person, they're immersed in the comet tail, uh, actually tails, because you have the gut brain and the mental mind, the lower body, mental body and the higher mental body. So the man has actually two tails trailing behind him. And if you get too close to him, then you'll be immersed in his thought forms and affected by them. At the same time, this man who is putatively walking down the city street walks past, say, a bar or uh, a brothel, right? And, and all around this brothel, stretching far out into the street, are thought forms of the sort that Arthur Powell calls depraved, right? Now, now in today's society in the United States, you may not um, cotton to this idea that some thought forms are depraved. For instance, young children these days, when they go to the movies or, or look at their, um, their laptop or handheld games, they have no choice but to, to view and assimilate violent and what I would call depraved thought forms. There are no choices in the mass media today for education of young children other than depraved thought forms. Now, now, you may say, this is old-fashioned. This notion of depra depravity is old-fashioned. Um, but I think that there's something to it. There's something to soul learning and soul evolution that's been, that's been lost right now and is just about to come back again. So now to get back to Arthur Powell's description of this man walking down the street, and suddenly he goes past a bar, right, or a brothel, and all around him suddenly is this sea of depraved thought forms, right? He's a, his mental mind, his higher mental body, and his gut brain, his lower mental body, are both immersed in this sea of thought forms. Now, the subtle bodies of the human being are not um, solid like the physical body. They don't have the same ability that the physical body does to resist, for example, physical germs. Right? It, for the physical body, when a germ comes along, it has to enter the body either through one of the orifices, such as the nose or the mouth or the anus, or the vagina in a woman, or the tip of the penis in a man. The ears, if the, but the ears are, 
are sealed off with, with any luck unless the eardrum is punctured. Also, the tear ducts actually are a way that things could enter th into the body. So um, these orifices allow for foreign, like organisms or germs, to get into the body, but, and, and also cuts abrasions, places in the skin where the skin is broken, because the skin is the barrier to this kind of thing. But in the human body, there are less opportunities for things to get in, you know. Say a leech. You go into um, a river in the Amazon, and, and there are a lot of leeches in there, and a leech um, adheres to your skin and pierces the protective barrier of the skin and, and is able to mingle its bodily fluids with your blood. That's an, like uh, an attack on your the integrity of your physical body. But, but it's very rare unless you actually walk into this river and where the leeches are, right? And that happens. Or, or if you're in a swamp and, and there's mosquitoes in the swamp and the mosquitoes come and pierce the armor of your, of your skin and are able to intermingle their own bodily fluids with your blood, all right, which is how people catch a lot of diseases. So, so these possibilities exist for the physical body, but in general, the physical body has more of a shield of protection known as the skin against foreign um, organisms than, does, than do the subtle bodies. So for the subtle bodies, here's the situation. Here's the man, he's walking past the bar or the brothel, and, and his aura, his, uh, his subtle bodies, his, uh, it's not so much the etheric net, but uh, his, his astral body, his lower and higher mental bodies, and his causal body, I believe, those ones will be affected, all four will be affected by the environment of thought forms, especially emotional thought forms, in that like place of depravity. So what will happen then is that unless he is prepared and aware, uh, unless he is pursuing the path of enlightenment, unless he has a very neutral mind and is non-reactive, um, then when he encounters this, these thought forms, he will be impelled to action, perhaps of a baser sort. He might walk in for a drink of liquor. He might walk into the brothel and, and hope to obtain services there. And, and without even thinking about it, he might make these moves because of the sea of thought forms that has um, commingled with the thoughts in his own mind and in his gut brain. So... So in the subtle bodies, there's not that shield of protection against intrusion of foreign organisms um, that there is, which is the skin, uh, in, uh, in the physical body, unless awareness is placed on the heart and the electromagnetic field of the human being is ramped up. Then there's a shield of protection, or unless... The person is aligning their horror line directly with God all the time so that their mind, their, their heart, and their will are always aligned with the divine, the highest, and the core of earth. Those visualizations create the shield against the um, polarities of earth, the, the depraved thought forms in the case of Arthur Powell. The, such a man, such a man who has, has placed his awareness in his heart or on God, God in him, will walk past such thought forms without any concern whatsoever. So the, those are our shield of protection for the subtle bodies, those visualizations. onto the unconscious thought cloud of the world. This is a topic that, that I wrote about many years ago um, because it upset me at that time, and I was trying to get a handle on it and resolve it. And, it, and 
it, it is what you might imagine, the, the cloud of thoughts around a particular place of business, only the place of business is the planet Earth, our blue boat home, as they say in that, that beautiful song. Planet Earth has a cloud of thought forms around it that varies depending on a number of things. In the largest sense, it depends upon the electromagnetic field of Earth, which some say is shaped like a torus. But I say that this torus dances with the love notes of our sun in our solar system. It dances to the melody of the sun. And so it's not shaped like a a Washington apple with no core. No, it's more like as fluent and as expressive of change and emotion and thought as are the northern lights uh, in the sky of the northern latitudes of Earth. Our, our own energy fields dance in the same way as the Earth's energy field dances to the tune of, the, of our sun. Dance and shimmer and shimmy and exult in the, the life-giving blessing of our sun. And our sun, in turn, dances to the blessing of the great central sun through many sun systems onto that great central sun. And that great central sun is the physical expression of the creative force of this universe. Yeah, there are other universes. God is infinite, but let's just leave it at that high point for the moment. All right, back down to the earth level. Here we have the sum of all the human electromagnetic fields and other energy fields on Earth expressing itself around our planet in conjunction with messages from the sun, right? Now, in the broad sense, we have the solar winds and the solar flares that have great effect upon the electromagnetic field of Earth and upon what you might call the thought cloud of Earth, the noosphere. And the noosphere can be broken down into various sorts of thought forms, uh, emotional thought forms. First of all, there are the higher mental thoughts to do with the sentient beings on Earth, such as humans, but not just humans. Also, for instance, elephants, porpoises, and whales. Um, the, and, and on the astral plane, many other uh, intelligent beings. Then we have the subconscious thought forms. And in humans, the subconscious thought forms are div divided into two sorts. One are those thought forms that, that float freely and disperse. And the other are repressed thought forms from the subconscious mind, which are encapsulated and unable to leave the physical body or its near vicinity. Then we have unconscious thought forms, and these are the deep, like, seed of the, of the reality play for humans. Um, and it's the unconscious thought forms of humans that I'd like to address right now. On Earth, in the newosphere, we have a class of thought forms that I call the unconscious thought cloud of the world. Others have termed it the collective unconscious. There's a, a cycle of rising and falling of the unconscious thought cloud of the world that has to do with the habits of human beings. In the large cities, these habits have to do with the workaday world, 
because most people work, and also to do with the, the schedule of, of school children letting off school. So for instance, for school children, at about two or three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, the, the younger children get off school. Very often both parents are working and the children are what's known as latchkey children. So from three o'clock to about five o'clock or six o'clock, uh, there's an upsurge of rambunctious school child energy unattended by adult supervision in the large cities. Um, this is not always the case, but in, in, it's definitely the case in my area that from 3 o'clock to 5 o'clock, it's important to, to, during the weekdays, it's important to, for the, uh, the aware person to, to help the children to moderate and develop their awareness of the unconscious and subconscious energies of the city so that they can ferry the boat of their conscious minds across these unsupervised waters during that, during that 3 to 5 p.m. or 3 to 6 p.m. hiatus without adult supervision. That's one thing. Uh, the next thing has to do with the working adult life and the fact that uh, a great deal of repression is going on in, in the work life of people so that they can support their families, so that they can have a place to live for reasons that they feel are unavoidable. They have jobs that they detest or just mildly dislike. They have issues coming up with their bosses that they can't address the emotional issues because they're concerned that they might lose their job and it's to them very important to keep their job. They feel they have no alternatives, that they're trapped, right? And so there's a repression of emotion going on from nine to five weekdays in the big cities. A big buildup of like pressure cooker energy going on. Thus we have the working mothers, the working mothers who want to be home with their children. It's it's par for the course these days for both parents to be working to support their their children. One of the worst um, tyrants of the mind that the working parents face is the notion that they need to work forever so that their children can have a college education. All right? My own feeling about this is that college education will become less and less important in the near coming years and that parents should keep in mind that their example of not following their heart will haunt their children for the rest of their lives. I feel that there is a way for parents to follow their hearts and provide this example for their children. The very beginning of this is the workaday world. Are they happy at their jobs or are they not? Right? Are they doing something they detest because they feel they must? You know, How will they feel about their children if they feel their children are causing this to happen to them? They won't like their children. Their children will know this, you know. So there's a flow-through effect of not following our hearts that, that impinges upon everyone that we know, everyone that we care about. So, so there's that. So there's that that's happening right now in the large cities of Earth. Then on, when, on Friday, on payday, right, what happens is all this repressed energy, all this repressed negative energy comes out. Maybe the people get off work and go to a prostitute. Maybe they get off work and go to one of the many movies that are featuring, featuring fear, paranoia, and war right now, almost without exception, right? It, it, maybe they go home and watch it on television. It doesn't matter. Or maybe they do recreational drugs, right, to let off the steam, to let go of that stuff. But instead, the methods that they choose to do it cause it to become worse. Suddenly, there's a flare-up on Friday night and Saturday night, but not Sunday night, in the, in the big cities, a flare-up of extreme negative emotions bursting forth. It's this weekly, um, this weekly pattern of city energy 
that immediately impinges on the person who's awakening, and they wonder what to do about it, right? Some people leave the city if they're starting to awaken. Some people leave the city on the weekends just because of that. Other people feel that they have to stay home and meditate the whole time to steady the energy that's input into their own subtle bodies by the, uh, the like explosion of negative energy on Friday and Saturday nights. Now, if you're just at the point of awakening and you don't know what the heck I'm talking about, that's okay, you know? It's all right. But, but it's good to know that this happens once a person's electromagnetic field starts to expand so that you'll be prepared for the eventuality that it might be happening to you. What a long, what a long story this is turning out to be. Um, so on the weekends, I've come up with something new, and this has to do with the very beginning of this video. I've come up with something new to cope with the situation, and fortunately, it works immediately. Um, the first thing, uh, if there's a sudden like downgrade in your DNA because of the influx of thought forms uh, into your own subtle bodies, the first thing to do is to grab a glass of water, drink the water, and do one of Judy Satori's activations of light. That's, that's an, a, an, a fix that pulls you up a level or so uh, immediately. And, uh, and then lie down for a few minutes. And that will get you to the point where you can do something else. In addition, right now, uh, there's, there's a lack of light to deal with. I'm talking about November 2016 right now. We're in a solar minimum. The solar like flare activity takes place every, you know, approximately 11 years. And we're in a minimum right now. In, an, in a time when the sun's like light is less likely to cause positive change on Earth. It's more of a holding pattern right now. Further, we have an annual minimum right now. November, December, and then maybe the beginning of January every year, we have the lowest light in the northern hemisphere. Fortunately, that's balanced by the highest light in the southern hemisphere. But here I am. I'm not in the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> I'm in very low light. Fortunately, not in Alaska, where there's like no light. <laughs> and I'm also at a solar minimum. So, 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 so the first thing I'm thinking is to get a sun bath somehow during the daytime every day. And so to take advantage of what minimum amount of light we humans have in that way. It, if you're in a cold climate, maybe maybe at a window where the sun comes in for, for as long as possible during the day. And the second thing to do has to do with the rambunctiousness of the unconscious thought cloud of the world uh, at this time, right? It tends to the negative at this time of low light. So here are special instructions for dealing with the unconscious thought cloud of the world during this solar minimum, at this annual minimum for the Northern Hemisphere. On the most negative days of the week in the big cities, which are Friday and Saturday night. These are special instructions. <laughs> So the first thing is eating vital foods, just as uh, Norman Walker said, vital foods. And what I find is that plenty of protein of the least protesting variety and um, plenty of vegetables and vegetable juices are the very best thing right now. Your diet may be different, I don't know. Judy Satori has an Ascension diet that you can look at along with her excellent Ascension plan. So there's the diet, right? And, and just to let you know, what I've been finding lately is that fruit juices cause my um, cells to just go like, 
totally. They do the hula, you know. They get all excited, absolutely excited. And consequently, there are a lot of, like, frenetic uh, thought forms happening. And, and then all of a sudden they get exhausted and they all, like, want to go to sleep. <laughs> and so I advise not doing fruit and fruit juices and other sugars right now. You know, it's better to do, it's better to do protein, hopefully vegetable protein, not animal protein, but if animal, then perhaps just chicken and seafood. And it's better to do vegetables than fruits. There's diet. Then we have the elimination. I've talked about um, enema already. And what I, but I haven't talked about what happens when I try it on a Friday night in the city at this time. What happens is that immediately uh, my gut brain calms down and ceases to connect with the unconscious thought cloud of the city, right? And so suddenly I'm at peace in my lower mental body and my, my higher mental body can take a break from policing my lower mental body and trying to get it to just calm down. So, so the effect of the enema on the physical body is somehow to completely relieve uh, the upset of the impinging unconscious thought cloud of the city. So then I, I just wondered why this happens. Why is this? You know, Norman Walker was on to something, and it worked for me, too. But, but what is the mechanism of all this? And then I was taken uh, by surprise by something that happened t yesterday. Uh, the night before, I got no sleep at all, and this was extremely unusual. So my mind was completely awake. I think because I had had a little raw ginseng and what I had for dinner, and the ginseng somehow affected me, you know, like dynamite. It was like, you know, it, was, it made me full of energy, mental energy, and, and wide awake all night long. So the next day was a little bit rough because, because uh, I, I had had no sleep and I had, to, I had a lot to do, right? So I so was out um, doing my errands and, and it had approached rush hour when there are a lot of like, this is the time on Friday night, this is the time during rush hour when the people are starting to release the negative onus of repressed thought forms and strong emotions, negative emotions that they accumulated during the week. And the trigger for them is a rush hour traffic here in the large city, right? They want to get home. They want to have a good time. They deserve it like that, right? And the traffic is preventing them from doing it. And they, they start to get really, really furious, you know. I was at a gas station. And I was getting all these mixed emotions to do with Thank God it's the weekend and, you know, I can't get home because of the traffic, that kind of thing. So suddenly I had like a descent of consciousness. Um, my physical body suddenly became very worn out and this was the occasion for my, my, my mental activity to, to descend from my higher mind to my lower mind. And when that happened... Um, there was a downgrade of the DNA, and there was an upwelling of a feeling through the lower mental body, the gut, brain, and the bowel to do with threat energy. This threat energy had two themes. One had to do with other people attempting to control me and force me to do things that I didn't want to do. And the other had to do with other people trying to take things from me and to invade my space. Now I looked around me and I saw that none of this was true. So, so what was the cause of these thoughts? Right? What was the cause of it? Uh, clearly the thought about being controlled has to do with descending from awareness in the heart center 
to awareness in the third chakra, the willpower chakra, and then suddenly that turns negative, maybe from tiredness. Then there's this other feeling that there are people who are trying to take things from you, and there and there's no uh, there's no reason to think that you know there's no physical evidence. All right. So somehow or other, the lower brain, the large intestine has an issue with being controlled by something else and with having something taken from it. Interestingly enough, recently I saw three movies that all had this same kind of threat energy in, in them of, of people being chased by other people that were trying to control them. Uh, the first one that's, that really struck me was called The Last Avatar by Jay Wiedner, put out in 2014. And uh, it had, the reason I like that movie is that it had to do with the same process that, that the whole world is going through right now to do with the awakening and attaining enlightenment and arising with new earth and like that. And at the end of that movie, there was, and all threaded throughout it, was this, this, this energy thread or th of threat energy, and which was expressed visually in the movie as men, uh, like large, competent men with uh, camouflaged outfits on who were chasing the, 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 the hero of the story. And in the end, you know, he was victorious. So, so, but in the meantime, there were some tense moments with these, these camouflage outfits, gorilla people. And then uh, after that, I, I was checking on a Netflix uh, film, and I found one called Paradox, and I only got to the very beginning of it. It's Paradox by, by Michael Hurst. And uh, so far, it started out with threat energy. You know, someone was being chased, a young person was being chased by uh, people that were wearing gas masks and dressed in black, right? And then he was killed by them, and I'm going, oh my gosh. So so I, I put that one on hold for a while, and then I checked out the movies out, out in the world, right? Not just on on uh, computer, and and I tried a few. One that I remember is Inferno by Tom H Hanks. He's a main actor. And Inferno is, a, is, is also a movie largely to do with threat energy. Isn't that something? And there are many other movies to do with fear and threat energy out there right now. So, so you know, the feeling that I get is that, that this feeling that I suddenly logged on to Friday afternoon in rush hour. It, well, for one thing, a lot of people are watching those movies, and so they get the feeling that they're threatened just by, like, contagion, you know, from the screen and from the, the mu music that's being played during the m movie and from other people's thought forms that are created from the movie. Suddenly everybody's infected with, with like, threat energy, right? And so, but at that hour... Uh, probably that wasn't it. So, but behind all that, behind how how Hollywood is creating movies that enhance the fear of people and increase the threat energy threads on Earth, there's the question: Why are they doing that? You know, and this is the same as my question with regard to the sudden upsurge that I had on Friday night of that kind of energy. Why is this happening? Why would Hollywood put out this kind of movie and why would people be attracted to it? There was an article in Scientific American some years back by a gentleman named Adam Hadhazy and the title was Think Twice, How the Guts Second Brain Influences Mood and Well-Being. It's a very good article, published in 2010. I would advise uh, taking a look at that. I think it's a wonderful article, and uh, I'd like to expound on that topic myself. 
What emotions are being generated by the lower mental body during the various physiological processes undertaken by the gut brain? The gut brain is not like the, the brain and the spinal cord, uh, which has gazillion neurons all touching each other and are close and transmitting information to each other like, like, like a busy freeway all the time and creating the illusion that we have that this reality is a certain egoic way, you know. It's not, it's not like that at all. The gut brain is part of the peripheral nervous system. The nerves unprotected by the skull or spinal column which live and serve in the rest of the human body. Also known as the enteric nervous system, the gut brain is a portion of the autonomic nervous system that governs the gastrointestinal tract, including the colon. It is a mesh-like arrangement of about 500 million neurons. This is half of 1% of the number of neurons in the human brain. In, in, the, in the lower intestine, we have the involuntary nervous system. The, the, set, the neurons that aren't, aren't part of the, the egoic solidity of, of a person. These little guys, they're on their own in the wild and woolly outposts of the human body. And they're doing their best. And what really organizes them uh, is the body elemental on the astral plane, the body elemental of the large intestine. And this is a very cool entity with, with childlike exuberance and joy that really knows what it's doing as far as repairing and facilitating the operation of the lower intestine is concerned. So that the greatest intelligence in the large intestine, to do with the large intestine, is the body elemental, the beautiful body elemental, uh, like, like a little child that with great expertise at healing through light and sound, that, that repairs and regenerates and oversees the function of the large intestine all our lives, right? The cells themselves, the, the neurons there, the specialized cells called neurons, they, they transmit a truckload of information to the, to the brain, right? In fact, most of the information, like traffic between the gut brain and the higher brain is from the gut brain to the higher brain. Now, it's possible, as is stated in the Adam Hadhazy article, that the main content of this transmission has to do with mood and well-being. I, I'm hesitating because this top this this theory is just so very out there. <laughs> so then the question is, what makes the gut brain unhappy? You know. Now thinking very microscopically, down to the level of the cell, imagine that you, your awareness is right there with that neuron and you're talking to it, right? Okay. What is it concerned about? And here's the intel that I got last night from this and from talking to the body elemental. Here's the beautiful child. Um, you're afraid of invading organisms. You're afraid of specifically and mostly bacteria and yeasts and stuff like that that are 
located in the feces, inside the colon, and w prevented from entering the bloodstream by that mucus, you know, that mucus that secreted all around the uh, outside of the large intestine. But when the bowel or bowels are full, then there are, and if they've been full for a while, right, not evacuated for a while, then inside the feces are propagating at an alarming rate from the perspective of the, of the body elemental and the, the lesser perspective of the neuron, propagating at an astounding rate are these invading organisms, the bacteria and the yeast and so forth, little things that, that pose the threat of getting into the inside of the body from the lining of the large intestine. The invading army of the night, as it were, the army of the night. <laughs> Further, from an astral point of view, the, the feces, the excrement inside of the large intestine carries a, um, a vibe this astral, the astral matter that conforms with the physical presence of the excrement inside the body is of a lower, like, vibrational intensity, uh, a more dense uh, feel to it than does the matter of the large intestine itself. So there's a conflict here. There's, there's a feeling of defensiveness on the part of the large intestine defending itself both against the physical threat of the bacteria and the other microorganisms that are propagating inside of the excrement and also of protecting itself from the disparity of, of frequency of the astral matter that's that's inside of the excrement. So of protecting the body and keeping it in a higher state of elevation. And so when that threat is present, I propose that threat of the invading armies of the night, which can take place all night long because the battle might be full all night long, you know, then this threat energy is being transmitted from the gut brain to the higher brain and creating dreams that have to do with threats and, and astral stories to do with that. So essentially, the reason for the Hollywood movies, the extensive Hollywood movies on, on being controlled and chased and, and having things taken away from you has to do with the eating habits of the modern human beings. Right? We don't eat things that allow us to clear our bowels uh, properly. And consequently, inside our bowels are breeding microorganisms that are not necessarily helpful to human beings. The vast majority of, of microorganisms in the excrement are not helpful to humankind. They're invasive. They're invaders. The science fiction, you know, there's a science fiction story about um, the beings of Mars, you know, the warrior beings that, I forget how that story went, that, you know, th their essence was placed as microorganisms in rocks that were hurled as meteorites from the moon to Earth, and there are these bacterial-like entities in the rocks that were let loose upon humankind. This is rather dramatic. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's also very impressive, the thought that there may be like Mars warriors inside of our intestines. <laughs> okay, a little too out there, but, uh, but it serves a good point. It points out the point of view of the, of the cells that make up the large intestine. They feel that they're, they're, the army of the night, which is alien invaders, is like uh, pressing against them and threatening to overwhelm them and control them and to take things from them, 
to take from them their, their, their health, their happiness, their very lives. And this is a message that they send to the higher centers all night long, right? And this is the reason for, for the Hollywood movies is, is the eating habits of Americans and, and of people in the modern world. And this is, this is why when we use the, the water enema, it immediately affects everything, you know, from the point of view of, I don't know what kind of science this is, but, but apparently when the, when the gut brain, the not so smart, not so well connected outposts of our nervous system, it, it suddenly no longer sense the army of the night, you know, the darkness there, then they're able to relax right away. They don't have much memory about it. They don't know that it'll probably be full of excrement again tomorrow. All they know is right now everything is fine. And so that, that load, that truckload of constant negative emotion going from the gut brain to the higher brain suddenly ceases and everything is all right, you know. Everything is at peace. The invaders from Mars are vanquished. <laughs> Long years ago, in the early 2000s, um, when I first to, like changed in awareness and became much more aware, in the middle of the night, in, in this great city that I live in, I used to hear on the weekends, right, Friday and Saturday nights, I used to hear sort of a singing and a chanting uh, in the unconscious thought cloud of the world, and it, 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 it went over and over again, we are the army of the night, we are the army of the night. And I used to wake up with like a nightmare about it. I used to think, who are the army of the night? And I used to see, in a vision, I used to see men, and mostly men, going out to the bars at night, and, and like with a warlike energy, attacking the people there for a one night stand, whether it be through male female uh, liaisons or male male liaisons, is not important. What is important is the energy involved, which was very, you know, up yours, very rectal, very, uh, in the case of women, misogynistic, in the case of men, homophobic. I think that's what it's called. In other words, men who hate people going out and having intercourse, one-time intercourse with people, and transmitting that energy of hatred and like up yours uh, to the other people through the act of sex. And, and in fact, on the astral plane, what, what it felt to me like was that this act would drain the other person, the person who was um, having sex practiced upon them. It would drain them of vital energy. Huh. So just a what if. What if it were true that there are invaders from Mars and that they're very, very tiny, microscopic, and that in people who, whose large intestines are too full, they can cause a feeling of, of like warlike hatred and cause them to act out in this way, in this profligate way on the weekends, creating like duplica uh, replicating emotions of hatred and fear from one human being to another. Wouldn't that be something? And so easily solved through diet. Further, suppose it were true that these bacterial like beings, these hostile beings, uh, these aliens from another planet, right, were um, full of this very warlike nature, this very invasive nature, as in fact, you know, even setting aside the alien hypothesis, Bacteria are like that, you know. They're very adventitious. They're very into, for me only, they're very like parasitic in many instances. Of course, there are good bacteria too, bacteria that are on our side. 
but taking these hostile bacteria into consideration, they're in it for themselves. They're warring against the human species, right? Maybe not with a higher mind and like that, but with their energy, they're doing that. So a person whose GI tract is not fluidly flowing and eliminating um, may be accumulating inside of their gut and, and in the worst possible case, the, uh, the case of the impaction inside of the gut, you know, with the constriction that really prevents. You'll have to read the book about it by Norman Walker. But, but there are cases, there are many cases where the GI tract is not functioning opt optimally. And might that result <clears throat> in an accumulation of warlike feeling inside of the gut brain of a person? Might that be the impetus of the peoples of the earth to wage war on one another? Is it possible? I'll bet you didn't buy this story hook, line, and sinker. But, but maybe... Uh, Maybe you could pick up a copy of Become Younger by Norman Walker and see what you think of that. It's very convincing, I feel. And it's a, it's a small book, but it, it's packed full of information. And if you don't like that, then, well, you could look on the Internet for Judy Satori's work on um, the Ascension Diet. She has a great Ascension Diet, very, very uh, fluid, very variable according to a person's specific needs. And you can also look on the internet for, for good, reasonable instructions on doing a water enema and see what happens. So that's the takeaway, I hope, and I hope you enjoyed all this. And I'll talk to you all later. Happy Thanksgiving, everyone.